This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority and from donations, so thank you very much. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Um, Eleanor Risa is a Brooklyn board and bred victim and beneficiary of the public school system from K through college. <laughs> And in spite of that, or because of it, she has had a life beyond her own imagination as a Tony-nominated director, a Broadway TV actress, a singer in every major venue in New York, a playwright, an artistic director of the Folks Bean, and a published author of The Letters Project, A Daughter's Journey. She hosts the podcast, Those Who Were There, Voices from the Holocaust, and narrates the Visitor's Guide to the Holocaust, What Hate Can Do at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. A trailblazing lesbian poet, child Holocaust survivor, and political activist whose voice is deeply informed by socialist values, Irina Kleptfis is a vital and individual American voice. Her birth in later years, New and Collected Poems, 1971 to 2021, is the first complete collection of her work. For 50 years, Kleptfis has written powerful, searching poems about relatives murdered during the war, recent immigrants, a lost Yiddish writer, a Palestinian boy in Gaza, and various people in her life. The Letters Project and her birth in later years are available for purchase in our Pikmin Museum shop and lobby, and Eleanor and Irina will sign copies for half an hour in our events hall following the program. So without further ado, please welcome Eleanor Risa and Irina Kleppit. Thank you. Um, we're thrilled to be here. Usually we just speak amongst ourselves, but now we'll speak amongst ourselves with you. Irina is going to uh, begin uh, by reading uh, some poems that she selected. And, and part of what we were going to focus on were or was our fathers. I'm going to stand. I, I just read better when I stand. Okay. Your time is up. <laughs> Not a chance. <laughs> um, you can hear me, right? OK. Um, just to tell you a little bit about my father, um, at the start of the war in 1939, my father, Michal Klepfisch, was an active member of the Jewish Labor Bund and he was in interwar Poland, and he was just finishing his engineering studies at the Warsaw Polytechnic. Um, when the war started, he became a member of the ZOB, the Jewish Fighters Organization in the Warsaw Ghetto. He was, um, did a lot of uh, smuggling of people and arms in and out of the ghetto, and um, he also established Molotov cocktails factories inside the ghetto in preparation for the uprising. He was killed on the second day of the uprising, April 20th, three days after his 30th birthday. I'm going to read a few poems that, uh, that um, are co connected directly or indirectly um, with my father. The old poet remembers the immigrant girl. From the start, the chorus always said, we don't ha want what you have to give. We don't care who you are. You have to become different, change. When she first walked into class and pledged with the wrong hand, they all chorused. She stood mute, ashamed as the teacher corrected her, still mute when they chorused the incomprehensible sounds. After a time, she understood that girls would talk behind her back about her ugly stockings, the bows in her hair, the braids too tightly braided. It was all noise and dust and cars and loneliness, a mother at work, a glass of milk, a sandwich waiting on the kitchen table. Everyone whispered she was no one's friend. They locked her in a closet until her mother came home and claimed her. She learned she would be outside that people would stop speaking to her and not tell her, that there was always a struggle to be in, which meant that someone always had to be out. She was dressed in humiliation and homemade skirts by the mother who had no husband. Once in class, the teacher asked them to tell what their father did, and at her turn, she stood mute again because she could not bring herself to say, he's dead. My father is dead. He has always been dead. 
the words were only sounds, for her memory was blank, but they were sounds she could not risk. So she stood mute again until the teacher asked, do you have a father? And she shook her head in shame, in fear, and sat down. She learned nothing they wanted her to know, but everything else about being alone, about keeping it close to her heart, about silence, about how her own words rebounded in that silence, about how she could use them, but only if she remained outside. Forty years after the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, my mother and I returned to Poland. It was her first, to first and only t last time, only time of her going back to Poland. Um, we didn't go at the actual anniversary in April, but a couple of months later when all the hoopla kind of died down. And um, it was an interesting moment because in 83, Solidarność was still an illegal movement. People were in prison. And it was also right after when we arrived, was right after when the Polish Pope had been there. And so Warsaw was just filled with small, beautiful altars with flowers in his photographs. It was very, very beautiful. Um, and of course, we were there for the 40th anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. So this is called Warsaw 1983 Umschlagplatz. No horrors this time. It's 1983. June, summer, Warsaw is tense, but over Solidarność, over amnesty. A small white brick wall, two plaques in Polish and Yiddish to the effect that from here, seinen sie gefahren kein Treblinka. Two stubby candles on either side, neither burning. The guide lights one with a lighter, the wind blows it out. A gas station pumping gas right behind, a building on one side, perhaps from that time, Efshoranedus, maybe it saw, and there are tracks, I think. I do not cry. What's to cry about? An ordinary street, people going about their business, 40 years later, tense about amnesty. This street might have been my home. This street might have been the beginning of my journey to death. I must remember it was neither. I live on another continent. It is 1983. I am now a visitor. History stops for no one. And um, so I have very little information about him, but I decided to write a poem in which I included everything I knew about him. So this is a poem called, this is written 40 years ago, about my father. He became a teetotaler out of his socialist convictions. During the war, he began to drink again. He was casual. He kept his tie in his pocket till the last minute before oral exams. He left me on the street to be picked up by the nuns from the orphanage. He watched me from a distant doorway. Once he refused to hit me, he told my mother his hand was too large. He wrote to his aunt that he hoped the baby would be a boy. When he was a student, Jews were not permitted to sit in the front rows of lecture halls. He made it a point to stand through the lectures, ultimately Jews were allowed to sit. He was a discus thrower. According to some, he got along with everyone, Jews, Goyim, children. He was caught a couple of times by the Germans. They thought he was a Polish smuggler. Once he was put on a train for Treblinka, he jumped, was shot at and wounded, but got back to Warsaw alive. He believed in resistance. And this poem was written almost 40, 40 years later, 
when I discovered that the Warsaw Polytechnic had his student file. And it was just an amazing, amazing discovery for me. I was like 75 at the time because I had nothing about of his except a f one photograph when he was, which turned out to be his school ID. So he was like 17 or 18 in the photograph. And um, I discovered his birth certificate, his uh, school grades, and most importantly, handwritten notes that he had made to the administration for uh, tuition deferrals or help or something like that. And what struck me particularly about this find was the last note, which was dated March 27th, 1939. If you all remember the date, September 1st, 1939. So this is called Mar March 1939, Warsaw, Poland. I understand nothing but the date, March 27th, 1939. I want to whisper, grab everyone and run to the nearest port, the nearest border. But he is worried about tuition. He understands oppression, hatred, slavery, torture, but extermination, genocide, gas, ovens, Jakob, Miriam, Gina, and Rikla, all his Bundist comrades, fellow students, athletes, and Friedrich, extermination. I press. Bobcha's lace, forget the books, the photo albums, the anniversary brooch, forget the diplomas, Jakob's, Miriam's, Gina's, yours, Myers's drawings, tell Rushka to hurry and get her mother. No time for goodbyes to Guta, Krisha, Mayus, but take papers, money in the desk. Forget the protractor, rulers, pencils, notebooks, take the knapsacks, pack scissors, clothes for layers, hats, scarves, a compass, remember needle and thread and also string, an extra pair of shoes. Talk calmly, but hurry the old ones. Go, run, don't look back. Just go, go. Michal, don't try to be a hero. Be my father. It's March 1939. In just five months, the butcher will begin grinding meat. It turns out that Irina and I um, have a lot in common. Uh, her father was killed in the Warsaw Ghetto as a ghetto fighter. My father, Haskell Schlisselberg, was um, not. Uh, he was a prisoner in Auschwitz from 43 to 45 and then was on the death march. And this book, The Letters Project, is about um, these letters that I found when my mother died, uh, 50, 56 letters written in German that I didn't know, um, that I didn't know I had or that she had. Uh, it took me until 2018, 2017, to finally get them translated. And as it turned out, uh, the woman who translated the letters said to me one day, uh, I'm, my brother lives around the corner from the address on your father's letters. And so if, and I'm going there in January, so if you want to go with me, I'll, leave early, stay late, and we'll go around. And, I, and, and it had never occurred to me to go to Germany because I thought there was nothing left to find in Germany. Everybody was dead. I didn't think there was any there there. <clears throat> but of course, I was plenty wrong. And uh, so this book is about this trip to Germany where many people, mostly German citizens whom I didn't know, 
helped me look through archives, which I usually don't do, and find things that in my wildest dreams I never thought I would find. And so consequently, uh, my father, who came to America in 1950, married my mother, uh, died in 1976, was 50 when I was born, so I missed two-thirds of his life. Um, I, I met him the last third. In a way, yeah, I met him, um, I met him the last third when two, two, two-thirds were already gone. Uh, the real man before Auschwitz was, old, was long gone and he was a sweatshop worker in America. The divorced from my mother six years after their marriage and basically lived a life you would wish on your enemies until he died in 1976. But, so on this trip to Germany, I, the translator, Yeva Lapsker, found documents, 30 pages, in German, so she had to send me, you know, she and I had other people translate too, because it was a big old mess. And this is testimony that my father gave in that, uh, in that, to try to get Wiedergutmachung, which means reparations, to make better. That's a conversation that we can have another century from now. But, so part of this is what he writes, what he says. And it's about the death march, this particular section. We still weren't given any bread. Apart from, from the little that we would find in the open fields, we would have to share one turnip with five men a day, and from time to time, a couple of potatoes. During the day, we were forced to march constantly. At night, we would sleep out in the open fields. More and more inmates died of weakness every day. Any inmate who couldn't drag himself along was shot or beaten to death by the guards. During the nighttime camping in the open air, he, my father, dreamed of his mother in a kind of half sleep. Stop. My father dreams. Oh my God. Yes, of course. Of course he dreams, Eleanor. Have I ever wondered if my father dreamed ever? I feel sickened and ashamed that the thought had never even occurred to me. My father dreams. And of course, he dreams of his mother. In inescapable hell, who wouldn't dream of their mother? Mother, mother, help me, save me, please. Dear mother, I am your child, your son. Protect me, save me, mother, yes. That is what I imagine. Uh, in the dream, his mother told him that he could save himself only if he hid. The next day, he remembered this dream. His mother told him that if he was brave, he could save himself. So that day, he, sh he saw a short break in a canal. At the sight of it, he immediately thought of his dream, and so he acted. But when he had slipped himself into the canal, it was already full of other Jews. Because of that, a part of his leg was sticking out, invisible. As a result, he was discovered by SS, pulled out, and hit with the rifle butt against the right side of his head. That caused a laceration in the area of the right cortex and bled immediately. No vomiting, no nausea, no bleeding from the nose and ears, but bleeding from the mouth. The force of the rifle butt caused six or seven teeth to loosen and the lower and upper gums to bleed on the right side. I reread that paragraph. Six or seven teeth, that's one fifth of his mouth. This whole paragraph is reported so clinically. And now I understand something else. When your name and identity are taken away, when you are forced to become a thing, your number, you will always, from the moment that you are free, sign your name to every damn thing. Your father, Haskell Schlisselberg. Yes, that is my name. I am a man. I am not a number. 
It's like speaking about the murder of the six million as though they were a genetic numerical figure. No, they were humans. It was not the murder of a number. They were not six million, they were one, each one, a one, a one and only, a singular life, a you, a me, a him. When I was eight or nine, after the divorce, I went on a little weekend vacation with my father. We went to this hotel in the Catskill Mountains, a place called Avon Lodge, more exotic sounding than it was. It was the first time I'd been alone with my father on any sort of overnight since we'd left him. He and I shared a room with two single beds and a nightstand in between. On that trip, I learned that my father had false teeth, full dentures. He put them in a glass of water on the nightstand that separated us. It was, of course, very creepy to me, but until today, I had believed that he had dentures because he hadn't taken good care of his teeth. What shall I say about that now? That I wish I could see him and hold him and tell him yet again that I am sorry. I'm just gonna scooch to the end, um, cause There's something I wanna say that I've been holding inside for these two years, waiting for this moment to say here and now. I will repeat these words again and again until the very end of my days. My father and the others who lived and died during that time and that place were not survivors. No, I reject that term. Those people did not survive. Dogs and cows survive. What those people did, all of them, not just the ones in the ghettos or the forests or the basement or the camps was fight. They were fighters. Whether they lived or were killed, they fought. With every molecule of their breath and brain and brawn, they fought to live. With all of their heart and prayers and selflessness and selfishness and guns and books and pens and bread, they were Holocaust fighters, not survivors. They fought for their lives for our lives, for my life. In the cattle cars, up the chimneys, in the attics and tunnels and sewers, they fought. I am not the child of Holocaust survivors. No, that's a passive, minimizing, head-bowing term. My father never bowed down his head. He said, well, why should I? Why should we? Words count. I, Eleanor Risa Schlisselberg, am the daughter of Holocaust fighters, courageous humans who fought the devil like hell for life to the death. Can you imagine if the world had called them Holocaust fighters, to have been the daughter of fighters rather than the daughter of survivors? I would have been Supergirl, for goodness sake, strong and proud rather than an ashamed hidden light. Thank you. <laughs> Part of why I read that section was it had never occurred to me that my father was a fighter. I always thought that he was uh, basically a loser who got lucky. And I was the daughter of a loser who got lucky. And, and often I would look at Irina and I think, oh God, she's so lucky. Her father was a Holocaust fighter. Um, I wish my father would, you know, it's like a Holocaust hierarchy. Uh, how much did your father suffer? Well, mine suffered more and, you know, whatever that is. Irina, talk, just, just jump in. Can we just talk about this stuff? Yeah, well, I think it's really interesting about, first of all, about the word survivor. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I grew up in a Holocaust survivors community, a Bundes socialist com community. And... And children like me, I was four years old when the war was over, so I really had no memory of the war, would have never, ever called ourselves survivors. No kidding. Because we felt that that was a special word for adults who had suffered something. And as, a, as somebody who was totally unconscious, I could never, ever use that term. And it was only like later, like in my 30s, that the term child survivor occurred, which I felt was like, 
a little bit better because it was more accurate, and at least it, t it said something about my consciousness, you know, whatever. But I think it's interesting, you know, Eleanor read this. There's a, a Warsaw Ghetto uh, Uprising Memorial that, I, that I've been involved with and that I've been going to for decades at Riverside Park on 83rd Street. And Eleanor read this, this particular part of this, even more, I think, a longer part of version of it. And people had all kinds of, you know, you know, very, very different kinds of reactions. But I think one of the things that Eleanor says in that piece that I totally agree with is that we're really wrong in just thinking of armed resistance, um, physical resistance, as the only resistance. And it just personally, I was always, I, when I came out as a feminist, I started thinking in very, very different terms, and I started looking back at my own history. And one of the things that, that occurred to me, you know, when, when I was growing up, my father's photograph was always hanging on the stage of some memorial in the city. So I was, oh, he was always the hero. And what I think was left out, which is something that you're talking about, was that when he was killed, he was killed on April 20th. He met my mother. My mother was, in, was on the Aryan side as a maid. I was in an orphanage. He met my mother on April 17th, two days before the uprising, because it was his, his and my birthday. And he, that was their last meeting. And they went back. And he was dead three days later. Now, the war is not over. <laughs> I'm in the orphanage, she's got Aryan papers, and she survived, you know, she managed to grab me out of the orphanage at one point when the Warsaw Uprising, the Polish Uprising happened in 44. She left the city with me. She saved me. Her picture was never up on the stage <laughs> as I started to think about it. So I think, and this is not to take anything away from my father who I thought was remarkable in everything that he did including being participating in my saving me, but that there's different ways of looking at both survival and resistance and what resistance is. And um, I remember one time, I think it was Vladka Mead, but I'm not sure, maybe it was Hannah Frischdorf, said at, at a memorial, she said, you know, the woman who was selling apples on the street corner who saw some Nazis chasing a Jew down the street and who pointed them in the wrong direction was a resistance fighter. And I always remember that. I was a kid, you know, I was like 12 or 13 when I heard that, her say that. And it always stuck with me in a certain way that there are very different forms of resistance and that you resist just by surviving. Yes, but even, but, but the only thing I would like to say is y you resist and even if you don't survive, right. even, even if you fail, even if you are killed, even if whatever happens to you, you still, you lost that fight, but you still fought. Right. All of those people who succumbed to the horror were not sheep or uh, they fought until they couldn't fight anymore. They lost the fight, but, but the, the characterization of them through decades that they were weak or that they something is really, ignorant and minimizing of a people that did the best they could under circumstances where they didn't have a chance, where those that lived were really the miracle um, of the whole thing. And, and just a, a tiny thing about my father, for example, I had no idea, I thought he was this, you know, goonish. To, I learned that he was the only survivor, the only person from Stuttgart on his transport to come back alive. That this was the guy who I thought was a weakling, a goonish, a nothing, turns out to be the only person from his transport to live. But um, maybe we'll talk about the writing, Irina. Sure. So, so in Irina's book, uh, which I ha ha I'm holding up a copy here so I can get mine inscribed. There's different kinds of poems. Uh, there's poems that are very prosaic, right? 
and some not. Can you talk about why you write in prose and versus the, the I don't know what you call the other? Free verse. Free verse. That covers it all. Okay. Um, it's not necessarily a very rational decision. It's, a, it's not an irrational decision. It's a non-rational decision, let me put it that way. Um, and I very often, like in the poems, for, like Bashad, for example, except for one section, the very last section has a lot of rhythm in it and a lot of um, broken lines. I was really kind of experimenting to see how much I could push into a poem, how much prose I could push into a poem and keep it as a poem. They're not short stories. I mean, they're just there's, there's a poetic element to them. Um, I don't think it's a really conscious decision. It depends on the circumstances and the kind of mood that's behind it. Um, and it's it's very tricky to explain the form of something. It's it happens somehow when I write. I mean, I I sometimes think I shouldn't get credit for what I write because some of it is so unconscious and un it comes out of. But, and but like you write about as do I places that we weren't at and people that we didn't know. Yeah, we lie. Well. <laughs> I prefer to say we imagine, yeah. <laughs> and that's what it is, isn't it, Irina? We well, it is to some extent. You know, I, I, I don't. You must get this much more where people really assume that you're telling, unless you tell them, they're assuming you're telling them the truth. And people assume that poetry is always completely truthful, especially if it's a, written in the first person. So it's really about me. You know, if, it's, if I'm right. If I'm, it's my poem and I say I, it's really Irina. But that's not true. <laughs> I hate to disillusion people. I mean, it's just, um, you make up things for the sake of the poem. Um, now that's more true in certain kinds of poems. Um, I didn't make up anything in the poem about my father. The poem, March 1939, is completely fiction. I mean, I just imagine what I would have, might have, if I had known what was happening, I could be there and I could talk to him. I mean, it's like a surrealistic, completely surrealistic. So you just sort of, I think you adapt yourself. And I think sometimes you just um, make things up because it makes the poem better. And if the poem is better, it means what you're trying to say comes out better. And that's what you really are aiming at. You're aiming at to be understood. And you may be better understood if I lie to you a little bit, um, or imagine, or whatever, however. Well, just more, yeah, yeah, just I mean, more. I did, you know, when I have a section about my mother in Bashet, it's called My Mother's Walking Down the Road, where she was at a moment in, um, during the war when she was completely isolated. And this, is, this part of this is true. She bumped into, by accident, my father's French teacher, another Jew, Bundes. I mean, it was just a total one. Of she told, the reason you know this is because she told you she this. She told me that, so. But everything else, I'm sort of imagining what she's thinking, what I'm feeling. I, I don't, I just. Right, but it's based, but the nugget of it. Yes, but I'm, in order to elaborate and make it effective, in order to make her meeting with Pani Helena that day, really as shocking and as terrible and as incredibly meaningful. I had to back it up with how isolated she was. What did I know? She didn't tell me. No. <laughs> she just told me I hadn't talked to anybody, you know? Right. But she told you I ran into yeah. Pani yeah. Pani. That was, very, that was a very important, that, that saved us because it reconnected her with the underground and she'd been completely cut off. So it was like, but I made up a lot of this stuff. Well, I mean, and that's the difference. You know, you asked me earlier, we, we were just thinking of what we would talk about, and uh, we wasted some questions on each other <laughs> and answered them, so. But, but one of them was, I, Irina asked me what the difference was between writing plays, which is mostly what I've written in my life, and writing this book, and always I've written about the Holocaust, whether in whatever form uh, it is, and always I've written about my family in whatever form, but mostly it was all imagination. You know, the plays are 
something based on an event, on a story. It's all kind of impressionistic. It's not necessarily the truth. It has a better hook than the truth. Yes. And, and what I noticed also was that all of my plays end in, the, in a similar way, uh, which is the dead come back to life and the family is reunified. Um, that's kind of how they all end. And uh, the book is kind of the first truth that I've written about because I learned the truth. It, it's not my imagination. It's not what I made up. I, it's, it's not based on some story that somebody told me. Um, and it's a big relief, actually, because uh, the truth is I met them. You know, they're dead. I met them. I know who, more about who they were and consequently more about who I am, and so I'm kind of unified with myself now in a way that uh, I, w I, I haven't been before, so. I don't have anything remotely like that. I mean, I told Eleanor, first of all, that um, one of the things I really envied was her having the photographs that she has. I have one This is Holocaust envy. This <laughs> is, you're looking here at Holocaust envy. Uh, she had photographs. I mean, I have no photograph of my parents together. I mean, I don't have a photograph, you know. Uh, you know. Yeah. So, I mean, and I don't have any family. I mean, I have like two family, one photograph of my father's parents and one photograph of my mother's mother, and that's it. And there's no stories, that's the other thing. My mother didn't, my mother was silent in a way like your parents were, except that I, what I learned was I learned from around the community stuff about maybe about my father's stuff, but any intimate stuff, she wouldn't tell me. I mean, she just didn't want to talk about it. And so in many ways, you had the parents, I didn't have the parents, but you knew as little as I knew. <laughs> and I ended up still ignorant, and you found out some things. But in a way, we sort of never really knew the person while they were alive. So, I mean, it, it's sort of, it's a very, to me, it's a really interesting similarity and difference in, in the experience. And then the other thing I think was, you said in one interview, you said, um, what could I possibly write about now? And my attitude was that when I was in my 20s and early 30s, all I wrote about was the Holocaust. All my poetry was about the Holocaust. And I really was upset by that. I didn't want to be writing about the Holocaust for the rest of my life. And as I like to put it, I, when my early 30s, I came out and I suddenly had a life in the present. And that there were present dangers as opposed to the imagined dangers. And it was just, it changed completely. And so I was able to get away from the Holocaust. I wanted to get away from the Holocaust and not write about it. And of course, it comes up because it's my childhood. I mean, you think about it, it's not something you just bury. But it wasn't nearly as intense as it was at the beginning in my 20s and 30s, early 30s. So it was quite different. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I say in the book that uh, the Holocaust is my gender that I define myself uh, as a Holocaust person, you know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I'm not proud of it or anything, but uh, that just is, it, 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 it frames everything. It frames, it frames every single thing, so. Yeah, I think if you did a, I mean, you're, this book has 50 years of poetry, I think of it's, 20% about the Holocaust, I'd be surprised if you counted the pages. I'd be surprised if it's that little. I don't, th no, I think you'd be surprised. Well, I guess we I, I will we'll take a look when this is, we'll, we'll. <laughs> but it does come up, but I mean, there's so many thing, other things that I've written about that I feel just probably just as passionate about work, about being out, about, you know, I mean, there's, I don't know. Yeah. When did you start writing? I started writing in my teens, primarily because I was a horrible, horrible English student in high school. And English was my fourth language. When I emigrated here, I was going on my fourth language and I didn't want to come here. I didn't want to leave Sweden. 
and um, I was just a terrible English student. And I started writing poetry because I was really clever. Um, I thought that if nobody could tell me I did, was doing anything wrong. Right, you didn't have to have a verb or a I noun or anything. I nothing. I, nothing had to be grammatical. And so that was poetry to me at that time. Uh, but it was trying to find a language, basically. And I think it took me years, because I wasn't, Polish was my mother tongue. I spoke Polish with my mother not Yiddish, and then yeah, I started, I learned Swedish when I was in Sweden, but then I forgot that, and then I came here and I had to start learning English and Yiddish because my mother was sending me to Yiddish schools. So I was, I was a linguistic mess. I don't think I had a really complete language until into my 30s. That's so perfect. I mean, that's so no, it was, perfect it was, that you became a poet. Yeah, it was very, very painful. I mean, my English, getting the, I used to, they used to give double grades, A for content, D, F for grammar, you know, that was me. Uh, it was just totally humiliating. <laughs> well, we put a stop to that. <laughs> Should we see if there are questions or, yes. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of it stemmed from that period when I went to Poland with my mother in 83, and at that same time I had come out, and I was very active in the second wave. I was became friends with uh, some uh, writer that some of you may or may not know. You should know her, though, Gloria Anzaldúa, Borderlands. Um, she was a Chicana lesbian from Texas, and she used a lot of Spanish in her, in her work, and she didn't translate the Spanish. And we were, became roommates over a summer program that we were both teaching in. And we became really good friends, and we talked a lot about our backgrounds. And she, of course, talked about growing up in Texas and Chicago. And I'm this Jewish immigrant from the Bronx. And as we talk, she sort of comes to understand that I went to Yiddish schools. I was in a community that spoke Yiddish. I did postdoc work in Yiddish. And it's nowhere in my poetry. This is like in 83. And she didn't challenge me, Gloria, but she, she thought it was really peculiar, which made me think it was kind of peculiar. And then I went to Poland, and I had this whole epiphany about the Jewish cemeteries in Poland that I saw in 1983. And I decided I just wanted to see if I could reconnect with Yiddish culture, and, because I, I was very attached to the culture that I grew up in, but I did nothing to, to remain attached or to continue. And I thought if I could find a way of incorporating Yiddish into my poetry, that could be one way. So it was an experiment. It's something I go back and forth about. The last poem in this book is a Yiddish, one of those bilingual, it's called De Fremder in der Fremd, uh, so, which was like the perfect for me. Um, but that's the story about how Yiddish I started. And I started really advocating for Yiddish women writers and intellectuals. And, what, what? Yeah, kind of, I guess. <laughs> My relationship to Yiddish currently is a uh, beloved. I mean, I, you know, when given an option, I prefer to speak in Yiddish whenever I can, to whomever I can. Um, for much of my life, uh, I wanted to be tall and blonde and speak Swedish. Uh, anything, really, but, but Yiddish. Uh, I think, in part, it was a little bit... Um, to be safer, you know, to not be Jewish, because Jewish is dangerous, but also to be assimilated, to be like everybody on TV and to be pretty, you know, to, that to me was pretty, not curly hair, not brunette, not, uh, you know, tall, lanky, blonde was what I thought pretty was. So, uh, but then I found work in Yiddish and uh, 
I, I had an agent once. I, I started working as an actor in English, and I had an agent, and I was doing a show at Town Hall in Yiddish. And it was like 1,200 seats, and we ran for two months, and it was a good job. And I went to this agent, and I said, listen, I'm doing this show at Town Hall in Yiddish, Rebecca, the rabbi's daughter. He said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> What do you mean? He said, don't tell anybody, they'll pigeonhole you, and that'll be the end. So it's like I was a stripper. You know, I did pole dancing at town hall, and it was so, so, so it was something that I uh, was somewhat ashamed of, and it was somewhat hidden. Um, I'm not hidden anymore. That's my coming out. I'm, I'm out as a Jewish white haired person. Um, and uh, I love Yiddish a lot. I, I wish I read it better. I, I, I'm really, really slow reader. Um, you know, I'm not a scholar. I wish I were more of a scholar, but I'm not. Um, but it's gorgeous, and I'll do whatever I can. I love writing in Yiddish, even that I write badly, or I don't see why that should stop me. Um, and as they used to say, you know, Yiddish been very, very good to me, really. Uh, it really has. So, I, yeah, it really, really has. I feel really lucky, uh, and I'm, 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 I'm even luckier that I realize that I'm lucky before it's too late. So. Um, but then, it, do you have a question for me, Irene, or should I ask you a question? We have these people, we, we have them captive for another 10 minutes. What do we wanna, what do we wanna share with them? You forgot what you, yes, yes. I mean, I, I, I'm just going to, thank you. I mean, so somebody will sometimes say to me, well, how did you, wh well, how did you write in that style? Was that a, a conscious decision that it's so personal the way, and so I write in my journal every day and have for decades and decades. So, I mean, and I, and I said to Irina today, um, so we've been, you know, we're friends for a long time and we spoke, we've been talking about this a little bit and how it should go and this and that. And uh, so I wrote a poem yesterday and I haven't written a poem. I took a class with Irina last year and I wrote a bunch of poems because she's an inspiration. And uh, so, just from hanging out, I wrote a poem yesterday. And so this thing about imagination and lying, or Irina and I, I it, it's, I, I, I mean, I hope, I don't know what people do who don't write. I don't know what you do. I don't know how you live. I don't know how, how do you know what you're doing? How do you how do you make sense of anything of your feelings or of history of the future of today, un unless you write? So so that's that's where I live, and I, I I and that's where Irina lives. Do you live there, Irina? Oh come on! microphone. I don't write every I don't write every day. Um, I, I never have, actually. I mean, there are periods where maybe something's going on and I feel like it. I've always had a kind of, to some degree, I've had an ambivalent feeling about my writing, which is, um, and I, it was sort of brought to, I, I was sort of reminded of it more. I've always felt somehow that when I'm writing, I'm missing out on something that else that's going on. 
And so I just resent having to sit there and work. And you know, my partner Judy, we, she had a house in the country, and um, that um, that I that I still have go up there. And I found just a few, a few weeks ago, I found some old photographs that reminded me of this dilemma about how I, you know, you're up in the beautiful country. Why should I sit inside and write? I mean, I want to go out, and it feels like a burden. And so um, Judy found this old school desks, you know, that had that sort of a shelf underneath. It wasn't a drawer, and there was like a place for an inkwell. Mm -hmm. And so it was a top, a shelf, and, you know, and she bought it, and she put it outside in front of the garage. <laughs> and what I found was one of the cats, my cat Saurus, sort of slipped into the shelf. But the reason we had it was that Judy was trying to help me out so that I wouldn't feel I'm missing out on the country by, <laughs> by sitting inside. And it is a kind of, it was a kind of, I don't know whether it's a resistance, because you're right, we, we write to explain things to ourselves. No matter what you're writing about, you're kind of trying to explain something to yourself. And I, to me, I think there's sometimes, sometimes a resistance to that knowledge. I'm not sure, you know, I want to know it, but I'm not sure I really want, do I really want to know this about myself or about some, something that's going to pop into my head because sometimes it can be really painful it's not you know um it's not always painful but it's there's a kind of resistance to you know it's like sometimes i think um well i say my mother never talked very much i mean i said that to you all before maybe i was afraid to ask you know i mean when i think about myself because was I just protecting her by not asking because I didn't want to have her feel pain? Or was I protecting myself because I didn't want to hear the painful answer? You know, I mean, it's a very tricky thing to know exactly what the truth is. And I, frankly, am not one of these people that rushes towards, <laughs> I mean, I want to be outside enjoying the country. And um, so it's a kind of, um, it's a twist on that for me. Um, it's not as much, I think it was more, it was more intense, I think, like 20 years ago. It's not as intense right now, but. What do you mean, when your mother was alive? Yeah, no, but just in general, I mean, about that resistance to sort of exploring what you're feeling or what you're thinking. Um, I mean, it's, to me, it's, writing is very, un is most exciting when it's unpredictable. I mean, for example, I'll give you an example. In the poem that I read at the very beginning about the immigrant girl, those three, I had, I had originally written, he's dead, my father's dead. And I was rewriting it, and I wrote, he's dead, my father's dead, he has always been dead. I thought, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> but I mean, it, in the rewrite, as you yes, were transcribing yes, it yes, to something in else. Yes, rewrite, just fast. And I looked at it, and I was just stunned, you know? And I thought, if this is a really accurate statement about my relationship to my father for the last 79 years. He has always been dead. That's all he's ever yeah. been. You know, but it came out unconsciously, and it was very painful. You know, it was not something I really wanted to know, but I think I've known it all my life. But it came out just like a year and a half ago. <laughs> So it's not always such a, it's a complicated. Issue. It's complicated, but it's worthy. It's, it's the, it, I mean, you know, the machsta tazoya, but it's worthy. <laughs> yes. You know, um, so all these 56 letters are all written by my father that m were written when my father hadn't received his visa to America, and my mother had. And he wrote these letters in German. Uh, he died in 1976. They divorced in 1960. She never told me she had these letters from my father. I mean, it's my father. I understand, but she kept them. They were divorced, she kept them, and she never said, 
here are these letters. So the letters were in German. I knew she spoke Yiddish, Polish, Russian, and English. I never in my whole life heard her speak German. I knew he spoke German. So when he says in the letters, it sounds like you don't always answer my questions. I think to myself, yeah, because maybe she didn't understand what you were writing. And I think, why did he write her in German? And I understand that he was maybe more comfortable in German, but he also spoke Yiddish. I so did he, Yiddish? he did he did write Yiddish, like she Yiddish. and she read Yiddish and she wrote Yiddish, but he lived in Germany from 1918 till 1950, minus the three years in Auschwitz. So, um, so I have imagined what my mother write, might have written back, but I, I, uh, it's black to me, the same way as to why she kept the letters and didn't say to me, I have these letters from your father and you might want to look at them. I, I, I can't quite make sense of that either. But then someone will say, but you yourself held these letters from uh, 1986 when I found them until 2017 when I had them translated. So what took me so long? Uh, and I might not have known except now I think I, so I have that imagination that says why it took me so long because I don't I wasn't ready I don't think uh, what made you ready? Uh, I was doing this play uh, on Broadway and so first of all I had some extra money but I don't think the money is the truth money is baloney a little bit because I, I, I could have done it uh, the the truth I don't think I felt, uh, I didn't know what to do with them. I didn't know <laughs> what to do. It's like cleaning your apartment or something. You don't know, I, sometimes I don't know how to do it. Were you afraid of what you, do you think there was some fear that, like, that maybe you would find out something you didn't want to know? I, I felt, I, I could have translated them at any time. I didn't think it was possible. I didn't, so doing this play, these women who did this play, they worked on this play for over 10 years and they thought it was possible. And so being with them, I thought they inspired me and I thought, do it. It might be hard, but do it. I, I, I have no good, um, you know, when somebody writes about me, maybe they'll say what it is. They'll make up some answer. The chicken bones is right. Um, I think we, I, 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 do we do, is this us, Grace, or do you do this? <laughs> Thank you, on behalf of Irina and myself.